on World News Tonight. Back to basics. China goes back to lockdown while battling its largest COVID-19 outbreak since the initial Wuhan incident. Authorities taking measures tonight to curb a fresh outbreak while residents battle deja vu of the pandemic. No nukes. In a historic move, the nuclear superpowers of the world have all recognized the futility of a nuclear war. Could this be the beginning of a global nuclear disarmament? Can the world really get rid of the nukes while making it a safer place? Tonight, the details. Remembering the riots. New evidence emerged in the U.S. Capitol attack where information on former first daughter Ivanka Trump pleading her father to stop the riots. And Winter Wonderland. Despite the festive season coming to an end, Washington becomes white in the new year. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. As we begin tonight's broadcast, there is grim news from China, as a city in central China has gone into lockdown to curb the spread of COVID-19. The municipal government of Yuzhou, Henan province, said all 1.2 million residents will be confined to their homes after just three asymptomatic cases were reported. Barring essential services such as supermarkets, all public facilities, including schools, public transports and shopping malls have suspended operations. According to the government of China, those who work in essential industries, including supermarkets, medicine production and in energy plants, are allowed to go to work after presenting a negative COVID-19 test. In the city of Xi'an, 13 million residents have been confirmed to their homes since December 23rd. Many are growing desperate as they run out of essential supplies, including groceries, and fall short on medical attention. Well, it appears that there is no outrunning this virus. Therefore, there are new efforts to keep pace. The Omicron variant has pushed the FDA to fast-track the approval of the Pfizer-BioNTech booster vaccine for children as young as 5 years old. Immune-compromised kids between 5 to 11 are eligible, while all kids between 12 to 15 are required to get the booster jab. As COVID-19 cases continue to skyrocket in the U.S., the FDA on Monday authorized a third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for kids aged 12 to 15 and for 5 to 11-year-olds who are immunocompromised. The agency also narrowed the time for all booster shots to five months instead of six months after the primary doses, saying a shorter window could offer better and quicker protection against the Omicron variant. COVID cases are surging due to the highly transmissible variant, which health officials say could quickly overwhelm hospitals. Studies show boosters appear to be protective against Omicron. Two shots of the mRNA vaccine are about 35 percent effective against Omicron, but a booster dose increases effectiveness to 75 percent, according to the CDC, based on data from South Africa and the United Kingdom. In authorizing boosters for young teens, the FDA said it reviewed data on the safety of a third dose provided by the Israeli Ministry of Health, including data from over 6,300 individuals 12 to 15 years of age who received a Pfizer shot. Israel on Sunday said it would offer a fourth dose of the Pfizer vaccine to people over 60 and medical staff. As the United States returns from a holiday break, it seems as though the world is on rewind. Schools in the U.S. are wrestling once more with how to safely teach the children while parents are pushed to get their kids tested before entering schools. With COVID cases soaring to record levels, an uneasy return to school, even though more vaccine protection could soon be available. While schools facing the highly contagious but apparently less severe Omicron variant are instituting a patchwork of policies to get kids back in classrooms safely. Cleveland and Atlanta schools are remote for the week. Other places delayed a return to class so children could be tested. In New York City, school doors swung open this morning, officials urging families to get their children tested. We're not in a good place. I'm going to be really honest with you. This is the winter surge we predicted. The New York governor placing an emphasis on keeping schools open. The question is, how do parents get these, these very rare test kits that you always see the lines for? We're going to put them in your hands. We're going to put them in the kids' backpacks. But they aren't there yet. Alina Konkin waited two hours to get her 11-year-old tested. There should be a more efficient and streamlined process. 
It's a similar story nationwide. Rapid tests are hard to find in stores. People are sitting for hours in their cars for PCR tests. The results sometimes taking days. As concerns grow over record numbers of children being admitted to the hospital with COVID. But at least some of those cases are children being treated for other conditions who happen to test positive for the virus. It's unclear if the number of severe COVID cases in children is on the rise. The CDC is also taking another look at its controversial guidance to decrease quarantine from 10 to 5 days without a negative test. Testing could be a part of that, and I think we're going to be hearing more about that in the next day or so from the CDC. Potentially adding demand for tests that are already tough to get your hands on. Israel has been proactive in its fight against COVID, but their zealous caution has taken a toll on its tourism industry. In a move to uplift the economy and move towards normalcy, Israel said it will admit foreigners with presumed COVID-19 immunity from countries deemed medium risk as soon as next week. Israel said on Monday that it will admit foreigners with presumed COVID-19 immunity from 199 countries deemed medium risk from next week. The move, which partially reverses a ban imposed in late November, suggests Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's government sees waning value in sweeping travel curbs, which have wrecked winter tourism. The new rules come a day after Bennett announced that the country will offer medical staff and those over the age of 60 a fourth coronavirus vaccine. Israel only approved the use of a fourth dose of the Pfizer vaccine for the immune compromised and the elderly living in care homes last week. Over the past 10 days, daily infections have more than quadrupled and COVID cases are predicted to reach record highs in the coming weeks. Bennett expects up to 50,000 could be infected daily. The rapid pace of infection has led to many Israelis waiting hours in line for coronavirus tests, although Omicron has not brought corresponding rises in mortality. Speaking in a televised address on Sunday, Bennett said the country was acting swiftly and decisively. Around 60% of the country's 9.4 million population are fully vaccinated, meaning they have either received three doses or have recently had their second. Australians have expressed anger at facing COVID test shortages and price gouging as a nation battles its most widespread infections yet. For more on this, we have other there in the world news special correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. Timothy? Yes, I'm ready. Last month, Australia lifted most of its strict domestic restrictions after reaching a 90% vaccination target. But the Omicron variant has fueled a surge in cases, now totaling over 25,000 a day. That's put intense pressure on testing and hospital systems, causing anxiety around the country. PCR tests have always been widely available in Australia, but the government began limiting who is eligible to receive them for free. It followed tens of thousands of people spending hours queuing outside testing clinics around Christmas. Isolation times blew out and test results were delayed. Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the new rules aim to elevate pressure on the system, but it has increased reliance on lateral flow tests, known locally as rapid antigen tests, which people have to pay for. Morrison's government has been heavily criticized for a supply shortage, and many instances of price gouging have been reported. Back to you, Arun. All right, thank you. That was Other Than the World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip from Melbourne in Australia. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro was rushed to hospital after feeling abdominal discomfort that doctors found was caused by an intestinal blockage. The president provided a health update on Twitter to ease the concerned public. A rough start to the new year. Jair Bolsonaro was rushed to hospital in Sao Paulo on Monday. This is the third time that Brazil's far-right leader has been hospitalized with intestinal issues in the last four years. A stabbing during a campaign event in 2018 led to emergency surgery at this Sao Paulo hospital. This new issue may require more surgery. The 66-year-old posted an update on Twitter alongside a photo of himself giving a thumbs up from his hospital bed. The tweet read, I started to feel sick after Sunday lunch. I arrived at the hospital at 3 a.m. today. They put me in a nasogastric tube. More tests will be done for possible surgery for internal obstruction in the abdominal region. Bolsonaro had been on holiday on the coast 
and was brought immediately to hospital upon his return to Sao Paulo. The latest issue comes as Brazil prepares for an October election, with Bolsonaro's approval ratings at an all-time low. He has been in power since 2019, but currently trails far behind his likely top opponent, leftist ex-president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who, according to recent polls, could seal victory in the first round. Now we have an update on the unprecedented act of international cooperation. The world's five major nuclear weapon states, including the US, China and Russia, have agreed that the nuclear war must never be fought and have declared that one could never be won. In a pledge rarely seen, the nations agreed to work together to reduce the risk of such a conflict ever happening. Avoid a nuclear war and put the brakes on the international arms race. The goals of the world's biggest nuclear powers, Russia, the United States, China, France and the United Kingdom, who signed a rare joint statement setting aside ongoing tensions on Monday. A thinly veiled message from the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council for North Korea and especially Iran, with the International Atomic Energy Agency accusing Tehran of accelerating its uranium enrichment program. We believe strongly that the further spread of such weapons must be prevented. A nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Global nuclear weapon stockpiles have been on the decline since the mid-1980s, when there were more than 70,000. The number stood at around 13,000 weapons in 2021. With nearly 12,000 warheads between them, Russia and the US account for 90% of the world's nuclear arsenal, far ahead of China, France and the UK followed by Pakistan and India, who, along with Israel and North Korea, are not signed up to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. For Moscow, Washington, Beijing, Paris and London, the common statement is a bid to reassure the international community. The group was set to meet to review the NPT, which was created in 1968 and has signed up 190 countries. But the conference has been postponed because of the pandemic. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi vowed revenge for the U.S. assassination of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani two years ago unless former U.S. President Donald Trump was put on trial. On the second anniversary of the assassination of General Qasem Soleimani, a stern warning from Iran. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi on Monday demanded that former U.S. President Donald Trump face trial for the killing or Tehran would take revenge. If a just prosecution court is set up for Trump, Pompeo, and the other criminals when they are prosecuted for the shocking crime and they face the consequences of their horrible actions, then so be it. If not, do not doubt that I will tell every American official that the fist of revenge will extend from the sleeve of the Islamic Ummah. Soleimani, the commander of the Quds Force, was killed in Iraq in a drone strike on January 3, 2020, ordered by then-President Trump. Iran's foreign minister at the time called the attack an act of, quote, international terrorism. Days after the assassination, the United States told the United Nations that the killing was self-defense and vowed to take additional action as necessary in the Middle East to protect U.S. personnel and interests. On Sunday, Iran urged the UN Security Council in a letter to hold the US and Israel to account, according to Iranian media. Tehran says Israel was also involved in the killing. Iran and groups allied with it in Iraq have been holding events to honor Soleimani. The 62-year-old general, Tehran's most prominent military commander and the architect of its growing influence in the Middle East, was regarded as the second most powerful figure after Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. A new subpoena has been issued for Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump Jr. New York Attorney General Letita James wants her testimony and documents as part of a civil tax fraud investigation into the Trump Organization. James also wants to depose the former president and Trump has blasted the investigation by the Democratic Attorney General as politically motivated. And then again, the House Committee is ramping up its investigation into the January 6th insurrection, including evidence Ivanka Trump has asked her father to stop the violence as the first anniversary approaches. Tonight, three days from the anniversary of the January 6th riot, the House committee investigating it says it has new evidence about efforts to enlist then-President Trump to try to stop the attack while it was happening, including appeals from his daughter. We have first-hand testimony uh, that his daughter Ivanka uh, went in at least twice uh, to ask him to please stop this violence. 
Since its creation last summer, the committee says it has interviewed more than 300 people and collected more than 35,000 pages of documents, including emails and text messages. While still battling the former president in court for more White House records and for testimony from top aides like former chief of staff Mark Meadows, who has claimed executive privilege. Shortly before his scheduled deposition, Mr. Meadows walked away from his commitment to appear. The committee aiming to hold public hearings and release a comprehensive report on the attack before the midterm election. But Republicans have slammed the credibility of the investigation because House Speaker Nancy Pelosi did not allow top GOP leader Kevin McCarthy to select members for the committee. McCarthy tonight accusing Democrats of using January 6th as a, quote, partisan political weapon. We have some good news for you. A new AI robot has been developed that can detect fine cracks in the lining of underground structures like tunnels. The robot is autonomous, meaning it can remove risks for people who will no longer have to go into such dangerous situations. A robot that looks like a small tank, 1.8 meters tall, moves slowly through a tunnel. As the cameras on the robot's arms scan the concrete lining, both big and small cracks appear on the computer screen. Based on the information transmitted from the robot, not only is the size of the cracks detected, but it also shows which ones need urgent repair. The AI robot is able to do so as it has studied thousands of images of cracks on roads and other asphalt surfaces. In the past, people have had to go into the tunnels or underground structures themselves and examine the surfaces for cracks with special microscopes. But this robot can detect cracks that are finer than 0.3 millimeters. Also, because these AI robots are autonomous or self-driving, they can maneuver through tunnels, sewers, and even underground facilities that are difficult to access without people having to go in themselves. As time passes, these tunnels need constant management and repair. The Korean research team plans to add functions to the AI robot so that it not only detects cracks, but also leaks or fires. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South African firefighters struggle to extinguish a new blaze at the complex housing the two chambers of the National Parliament in Cape Town, a day after devastating fires swept through the buildings. Turkish inflation climbed to a nearly two-decade high on the back of a weakening lira that is driving up the cost of food and other basic goods and destabilizing the wider economy. Dozens of snowball warriors gathered at the National Mall in Washington and split up into two sides to pummel each other with snowballs. In the aftermath of the Marshall fires in Colorado, with nearly 1,000 homes reduced to rubble and another 100 damaged, officials say they're actively working two scenes in search for the missing. Apple became the first in history to have their stock reach $3 trillion in value. This success has been attributed to the investor confidence stemming from years putting out state-of-the-art, best-selling products. The assurance that they will continue this trend is the root of their stock value rising. Apple on Monday became the first company in the world to hit $3 trillion in market capitalization thanks to investor confidence that the iPhone maker will keep launching best-selling products as it explores new markets like automated cars and the metaverse. On the first day of trading in 2022, Apple stock touched a record high of 182.88 when multiplied by its 16.4 billion outstanding shares. The iPhone maker's market valuation reached above the $3 trillion mark. Apple is the first to reach the milestone as investors bet that consumers will continue to shell out top dollar for iPhones, MacBooks and services such as Apple TV and Apple Music. Analysts expect demand for iPhones to remain strong in 2022 as Apple leads China's smartphone market and more consumers subscribe to its services. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other there in English. Well, despite the fact that Sri Lankans are enjoying a sunny weather, Americans in Washington, on the other hand, declared a snow emergency as a winter storm forced the state to close down governments and schools. We're leaving you here with some visuals that show the state of Washington in the depths of snow.